I'm going to go around. Okay. We're picking up where we left off today. Luke chapter 21. Remember, Luke tells the story of John, Jesus' birth alongside the birth of John the Baptist. Okay. So chapter 26, we learn that Zechariah doesn't believe that two old people can have a baby when the Lord says that it can happen, and he's mute. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be, Mary asked, since... I am a virgin. It's not a disbelief like Zechariah. It's like a scientific question. Biological. Wait a minute. Okay. And the angel said, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Okay. The language used here is very similar to the Greek translation of in Genesis when the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters of creation. God's Spirit is creating something brand new. Just like God's Spirit was creating something brand new in Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her own age. And she, who is said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she explained, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Okay? All right, so angel, the angel comes to visit Mary. It's the angel Gabriel, same angel that visits Zechariah. Does anybody remember? Where's the only other place in the Bible that we hear about this angel named Gabriel? You what? Like the dude riding the donkey? Like, no, no, no. Everybody just named the book. We talked about this a lot last year. Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. The angel Gabriel comes to Daniel centuries or 400 years before and starts telling Daniel about this anointed one, this Messiah that's going to come. Okay? Um, she's confused. It's not disbelief. She expects the Messiah to be fully human. So she doesn't understand how she can give birth to the Messiah when she's not married yet. Okay? She does believe. It's not unbelief. It's just confusion. All right. Mary hurries to Elizabeth, okay, because she says, yes, Lord, let it be fulfilled. But we don't, we often miss what Mary's actually doing, what she's actually consenting to, okay. Uh, we're in Exodus in the Old Testament class, and like, we just got done reading about how Moses was like, don't make me do it. I don't want to go talk to Pharaoh. I can't speak. I just send somebody else over and over and over again. Because there's risk, right? To go in front of Pharaoh and ask to let God's people go it was very risky. It's very scary. And Moses didn't want to do it. Like, he flat out refused so many times that God was like, fine, I'll send your brother Aaron, okay, to help you. But Mary knows this is risky too. It's not just a blessing for her. It's a blessing, but it's a blessing that comes with risk. Because to be found pregnant before she's married, especially when she's betrothed, 
betrothed, she might as well be married, so it's considered adultery. In the Levitical law, an adulteress can be stoned to death. Okay? She can face the death penalty for being found pregnant before she's married. So she agrees to it. There's risk. There's a great risk involved. I think we talked about this when we talked about Matthew. We talked about Joseph's side. So she hurries to go see Elizabeth because the angel told her, listen, your cousin Elizabeth has experienced a miracle too. So she thinks, I'm going to hurry and find refuge and safety with the one person who might believe me. Okay? That's why she hurries. It's not out of excitement. It's like, I, I, I better go find a safe place to to have this baby, or they're going to kill me and the baby, okay? Um, she's greeted by Elizabeth with joy, and Elizabeth and the baby in her room greet her with joy. So it's the opposite reaction that the rest of the world would have to Mary. The rest of the world is going to be angry and, you know, possibly threaten to kill her, and Elizabeth's reaction is joy, welcoming her. Even the baby in her womb leaves with joy. Because remember, Luke is writing to parallel, to link Jesus and John the Baptist. They're linked together. They're distinct, but linked. Okay? Um, in the rest of the chapter, Elizabeth has her baby. John the Baptist is born, and all the, the family's arguing. Elizabeth says his name is John. The family's like, that's a stupid name. Don't name him John. Nobody in your family's named John. And Zechariah, remember, he can't talk, but he writes on the tablet, his name is... John. John. His name is John. And then Zechariah is able to speak again. Okay? Alright. Luke chapter 2. Now, before we start Luke chapter 2, I want us to remember our electricity analogy. Okay? So remember, if you put pick up a book off the shelf in the library that's written in 21st century America... That book might talk about house as the setting, and the character might, they might write, hey, the character came in and turned on the lights. But they're not going to say, oh, they're not going to stop and explain to you what lights are. They're not going to stop and explain to you that there's wires that go behind the wall that lead to the magic bulbs, right, that, that light up the room. Because you already know when someone says turn on the lights, it's in the background of your mind what happens. You don't need electricity explained to you in 21st century America. This is where we are. Okay, sorry, it's hot in there. I the door. This is where we are with the birth story of Jesus. Okay? He's just throwing out phrases. They turned on the lights. There's background information that everybody else has and knows, but that we don't because we don't live in first century Israel. All right, the first thing I want to do is look at this TV. Is it on? Uh, like, it I know it's not hooked up, but is it on? Uh, it just yeah. turned off. Yeah. Now it's on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When a major, but not in the sale. I want you to look, stop right now for just a second and look at this picture. Somebody, I just need like one volunteer, tell me where you think this picture is and what you think it's a scene. It's a famous scene to famous people. It's like, like a Who do you think it is? Okay, Queen Elizabeth. And what country do you think this England. is? England. Okay. Um, and the desert. No. That's what I'm saying. Like, Okay. This is a painting that was painted in those time periods, medieval Renaissance time period. This is Joseph in Egypt marrying his Egyptian wife. That looks like Queen Elizabeth the first. We're talking about kind of big Okay. This is Joseph. This is the painting. The artist who painted this read the story of Joseph in the Bible. Okay? And said, I want, to, I want to paint Joseph in this Egyptian wife. This artist has never been to Israel. This artist has never been to Egypt. This artist does not have a class on history and, and, and culture and all that stuff. When this person, this artist, reads 
the Bible, the images that come in their mind are images that they are familiar with. This is their context. This is their world. Okay? This is what, when they read that story of Joseph, this is what pops into their mind. Because this is what human beings do. If we don't have the original cultural context, we're going to fill it in with what we know. That's, there's nothing else we can do, right? Our brains don't just pop up with stuff we've never seen or heard of before. We had this trouble all the time with our people in Hala, stuff we had to explain that they had no context for, no categories for. All right? I had, for one of my language tests, I had to describe getting my driver's license to two women who've never seen a car. They've seen a plane, they've seen a helicopter, never seen a car, okay? So it's a whole thing, all right? So this is what we do. When we read the story of Jesus' birth, we fill in with context that we know and recognize and understand. So everybody understands, like, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not simple, it's not incorrect. It's the normal human thing to do, okay? So let's read the first story of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Remember, Caesar is king. They have to do what he says. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius is governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, in Galilee, to Judea and Bethlehem. Remember, they're two different states. Galilee is like Tennessee. Judea is like Mississippi. Okay? He had to go to the town of Bethlehem because he was a descendant. He was in the line of David. David's from Bethlehem. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave, um, she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, and she placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. This updated NIV version puts guest room. Most of us know the story as what? Because there was no room in the what? In. Okay? For, for centuries, that word gets translated in. Okay? But the word does not mean in. The word means guest room. Okay? Guest room. There's two different Greek words used here for this. Okay? There's no room for them in the guest room. The word that they write right there is kataluma. It means a guest room attached to someone's house, okay? First century houses had one family room, living room. If you had enough money, you had a guest room. And even if you didn't have enough money, you did everything you could to, to build a guest room because remember last year how much we talked about hospitality. Hospitality is, is king, is key in Jewish culture, okay? So, if you want to offer hospitality, people are traveling through. There's not a lot of inns. There's not a lot of that kind of thing. Someone travels through, you need a place to stay. To not offer someone a place to stay in your home is extremely shameful. Extremely shameful. And it's an honor-shame culture. So everything is run by, I, I can't bring shame upon myself or my family. If I don't offer a family member a place to stay, that is incredibly shameful on you and your family, okay? All right, now, this Cataluma word is translated as upper room, because that's what it is, in the Last Supper in Luke 22. So why it was, why they chose to translate it as in for centuries, I have no idea. And my, my best guess, and what most people assume, is, is because of the manger. Because everybody, the Western world, gets caught up because of the word manger. Okay? All right, so let's look at a first century house. Did it change? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in a first century house, this is just like the, I'll show you what, you know, the better drawing of it. 
This is like a blueprint, okay? It doesn't work on the TV. All right, so here you have the catalytic the guest room could be on the side, but it could be on the, most of the time it's on the top. Living room, one room living space, this is where the family lives, everybody all together, okay? Mom, dad, kids, this is where they cook, this is where they sleep, this is where they live. There's an entrance and a lower level and a little courtyard right here where they bring in their animals at night. Most people do not have stables attached to their houses. These villages are tightly compact, okay? They're poor people. They don't have barns. The, the theory about caves and, and things like that, that's, that's for shepherds. Like shepherds out in the fields with caves, that's what they use as barns, all right? What people use to house their animals that are, in, that are with them every single day, not large flocks, their donkeys and things like that, goats for milk, the, the animals that they use every day are in their house, okay? There's literally a room built onto the house to bring the animal in at night so it doesn't wander off, so it doesn't get stolen. And on this level right here, there are mangers built into the family room. So that when you're feeding your family, then you turn around and you feed the animals. Okay? Let's look at another picture. Okay, this shows you a little bit better idea. Now this Artists didn't put like a, a manger in there, they just have like a bucket like that. Because um, this picture is not set to talk about Jesus being put in the manger. It was just set to show you the first century house. But it just gives you a really good picture. Courtyard, here's the animals, here's the family living. There's no, there's not like a wall here, right? Like the animals are just right there. They're just on that lower level. This is a family that has a guest room. It's an upper room. And then they even go on the roof to do stuff at times. This is a typical first century house. We've seen some of these kind of images when we watched The Chosen, okay? Now this one shows you a manger, it's in the corner. Most, the most common scenario was the manger in the floor of the family room. So you don't have to walk down and feed the animals, you just turn around and feed them. So you see the same thing. This one doesn't have a guest room, all right, which if you're too poor, you don't have a guest room, okay? If you, you know, come across money later in life, you can always build a room up here. You've been using that space anyway as a roof. You can get more money. You can build a room up there or on the side if you're not too hemmed in, okay? But people had mangers in their houses. They had mangers in their houses. And this is why we have translated it and have in our minds have created a different story because we're just like the people we laughed at the medieval people we laughed at who've never seen Egypt you know and who've never seen Joseph they read the story and they created images in their mind with what they know what in our culture where is a feeding trough located in your house in a what in a barn in a stable. So we read that word manger and we said, oh, Jesus had to have been born in a barn or in a stable. Because that's all we know. Because we didn't know that in first century Israel, the house of the animals lived in the house of them and everybody had a manger inside their house. Inside their house. Okay? So I'm not trying to ruin your Christmas. I'm not trying to ruin your nativity scene. Does it change? Does it keep you from being saved to believe that Jesus was born in a barn? No. It doesn't, right? That, just like that person is painting that picture of Joseph, it's the story and the meaning that matters. Okay? It's not going to affect your salvation at all. But it, do, it helps us have a clear and accurate picture of what's actually going on because there are some details that we're going to talk about tomorrow um, that we also don't have the you know background for the electricity um, knowledge kind of stuff for that it really does it does not affect your salvation but it deepens and enriches the story for us okay 
So the idea that Mary and Joseph are like hurrying, you know, and that they barely made it, that's also not what it says, okay? Um, it says that, why are we going to have that written? While they were there, okay, the Greek is, while they were there, at the time came that they were in Bethlehem, the days were completed or fulfilled for her to give birth, okay? So while they were there, she finished out her pregnancy. That's what it's saying. She went to Bethlehem. They were there for a while. Nine months is up. While they're still in Bethlehem, she gives birth in Bethlehem. It's not like they barely made it, okay? They, they were there. They were living in the family area of the guest room because the guest room is full. Why is the guest room full? Because what? Right. Why are there so many family members there that the guest room is full? Because of the census, right? There's a lot. It's not just Mary and Joseph, like, they went on a trip to Bethlehem to see Joseph's family. No, everybody's required to go who's from that line. There's a lot of people there, okay? That part of the story is true. That's why we think the ends were full, okay? But it's the guest room. The guest room is full. Joseph's family has to offer them a place to stay. If they themselves leave the house, if that's what they have to do, then that's what they're going to do. It is way too shameful for them to reject Joseph and Mary. And we know he has family there because he has to have family there because that's why he's going there in the first place, because that's where his family's from. Okay? Now, there is a difference. Um, I didn't write it on here, but there is a very there is a Greek word for in, for what we know of as in. And it is used in the New Testament. It is used in the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Because the Good Samaritan comes along, this guy's really injured. And he picks him up and he takes him to an inn. Totally different word. It's a totally different Greek word. So if the author, if Luke meant that kind of inn, he would have used the word for inn. And he doesn't. He uses the word cataluma, which is the upper room, the guest room that most people had in their houses if they could. Jesus is placed in the manger because most people had mangers in their houses. This does not take away from the story. This is a peasant family in first century Israel, right? It's a peasant family. It's a poor situation. It's a house where people live with their animals and everybody's crowded up in one room. Jesus is still born in very humble and lowly circumstances. And isn't that what we draw from the stable, you know, the stable story? Look, he was just born in a barn with the animals. Yet he was still born with the animals, right? Like he's still born right there, same room, lower level. He's still born with the animals. He's still placed in a manger. It's still very humble and very lowly circumstances. It is the opposite place that a king of the universe would be born. That a king of anywhere, any place would be born. The meaning is this. It does not change the meaning of the story. Okay? But the picture we have of Joseph catching the baby, you know, that we're going to run to the cave and Joseph catches the baby, it, it's just it's not accurate. Okay? These kinds of cultures, especially... Before Jesus comes and Levitical cultures of cleanliness and uncleanliness and, and men and blood, especially any kind of blood that has anything to do with a woman, they are out. They clear all the men. The most likely pictures, they clear all the men. The midwives come and they help Mary give birth to baby. Okay. Now, whose family are they with? Joseph's family. So the idea, Mary's not alone. She has the midwives with her. Okay, that makes sense. But she's not with her family. She's not with the midwives that she would know from her village. She's not with her mother or her sisters if she had them. Okay? So there's still that element for Mary that it's like, you know, I'm away from my home. I'm away from my family. All of these things, these ideas that we draw from the barn, still apply to a lowly peasant's home in first century Israel.
Okay. But we had just painted it. We read the word manger, and you're like, where are mangers? Mangers are barns. Jesus had been born in the barn or a stable. And, and that's what we did. We just filled it in. We colored in the lines with what we know. Okay? And that's okay. It's not sinful. It's not wrong. But it's really, really helpful to have the accurate picture and the accurate context. And then the, what we're going to talk about tomorrow with the shepherds, you'll see. It's, even, it's a deeper, it draws you in deeper to the story and deeper to what God is doing with the birth of Jesus. Now, the, she, the shepherds is also another proof that Jesus was not born in a barn. Because if the shepherds come and these two people are in a barn, again, we're going back to honor shame. It would have been extremely shameful for them to not be like, you know, like, come, you can come to our house, you can come to our house. Like, they wouldn't just leave them in the barn, like, leave and be rejoicing. They would, like, get them out of the barn. Okay? Um, now, this also, remember in Matthew, Matthew doesn't talk about the birth story of Jesus, but he talks about events surrounding the birth. And he mentions that the wise men come to visit Jesus in a what? Where did they visit him? In a house. They come to visit him in a house, and a lot of people say, oh, it's because they didn't they weren't there at the actual birth, and it might have been up to two years later because Herod killed all babies two years and under. And we talked about that, about how who Herod was, and all the ideas with um, astronomy and the wise men and all that kind of stuff. Okay. But it doesn't have to mean any of that. Okay. They they could have been there on the night. Probably not, the very night. But they came to visit Jesus in a house because he was born in a house, right? There's other examples. Sorry, I can move this now. Is that better? Do you use me? Okay. All right. Um, there's other examples for animals in the house in the Bible. Old Testament, Judges. Y'all remember from last year the story of Jephthah? He's this like crazy kill thug guy who goes who becomes a judge in Israel and he fights and, and defeats some people who are oppressing the Israelites because of their sin and rebellion against God. And he says, he's so happy that the Lord has helped him in his victory. He says, the first thing that comes out of my house when I come home, I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord. Okay? And we might think, well, maybe he wants to sacrifice a human. Does anybody remember the story? Who comes out of the house first? Say it, Lucy. Huh? Who? His daughter. His daughter. This is in the book of Judges. His daughter comes out of the house first, and he doesn't expect that. He, he rips his clothes. He's mourning. Okay? And, and he's like, I made this vow to the Lord. I guess i got to sacrifice to her. Now, the story, that story... In, people take that story out of context all the time. But that story is a tragedy because Jephthah does not know the Lord and does not know the law of the Lord to know that the Lord does not want child sacrifice. And if you have made this vow, there's actually Levitical rules for how you dedicate a child or give a child to the Lord. And there's payment you can do. They actually had to make payments and sacrifices for all the firstborn in Israel because... They were all spared in the Exodus. It was a symbolic worship and sacrifice. Okay? So the, the tragedy there is that, okay, Jephthah, you want to worship the Lord, but you don't know his word. You don't know his word. And you, you're going to do this horrible thing because you don't know God. All right? Um, then, also in Luke, okay, Jesus is going to heal a woman on the Sabbath. We're going to talk about this later. Jesus is going to heal a woman on the Sabbath, and, and the actual words he uses in that story when he heals her is he says, Woman, you are freed, which is untied in Greek. Which is untied. Woman, you are untied. And then Luke, remember, he's a literary artist, literary master. He answers the Pharisees. The Pharisees come and they're like, you can't heal on the Sabbath, right? He says, woman, you are untied. They're like, you can't do that on the Sabbath. And he says, who of you, like every single one of you, untied your animals this morning to take them?
him to go get water. Because you could feed an animal in the house, you give animals water in a first century house with dirt and clay and all that stuff, so it's not going to be good. Okay? So they came outside the water. Who? I untied her. You untied your animals in your house this morning. What's the difference? Okay? You took care of your animal. I'm taking care of my child. I'm taking care of my daughter. Okay? Um, there's early Arabic translations of the Greek right here. Okay, this story. So, these very, when I say early, I mean like some of the very first translations from the Greek. Okay, English wasn't the first translation from the Greek. Lots of people began translating the Bible in their languages, and Arabic was one of the first because there were lots and lots of people speaking Greek. They also speak. Arabic, not Aramaic. Remember, this is the Middle East. Okay, so they're speaking Arabic, and they're Arabic Christians. They want it in their language. And the most, they, this is the Middle East. Like they live there. They live in this culture. There's probably still some of these houses around. Okay, because it's not. It's a couple centuries, but not too far removed from Jesus. And the way they translate this story is, they say Jesus said, "You untied your animals from the house." Because they have the electricity in the back. And they know everybody in the morning, first thing you do is you go and tie your animals from the house and you take them out and you water them. Okay? That's, what, that's what they do. That, they lived in that culture. They lived in that context. And the same thing from this story, for sure, for sure, walking to a stable would be unthinkable on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees leaving their house and walking to a stable to untie their animals, they just, they wouldn't do it. They could only take so many steps on the Sabbath. So we have other support in the Bible for this. We have the historical, we have evidence, we have the archaeology, okay? We have all that now. In early translations, we didn't have all that. And it's okay. It's not simple. It's not wrong. But now that we do know, right, like let's tell the story accurately. Now, now that we have all this information, then let's tell the story accurately. It doesn't change the meaning of the story. It doesn't change the fact that Jesus was born in lowly, humble circumstances, accessible to all people. Okay? But... It's just a picture of why context matters, right? Like why, what we do naturally, what our brains naturally do, filling in the lines when we don't have the categories or the information that the original readers and writers had when they were writing. Okay. Sorry if I ruined your nativity. You can still put it up. It's fine. <laughs>